Charles Kettering, former head of research at General Motors, engineer and businessman, used to say inventing is a combination of brains and materials. The more brains you use, the less materials you need. Since the Stone Age, we have learned that the greatest innovations are made by those who dare to think outside the box, take risks and trust their instincts. In our own information age, two additional conditions have been added. Product risk assessment and liability. To avoid reinventing the wheel, we will discuss useful lessons learned with Marianne Heckman of Langsys and James Foto of Keller and Heckman. Welcome. Thank you. Marianne, what are the different types of risks that companies need to consider? And taking into account then the various angles you can assess, ranging from a substance to a product to the whole value chain. First of all, and I think that's the most important risk, this is the risk related to the use of our products itself. So we need to know in detail about the hazards of our product. And then it's difficult to ensure that the customers uh, follow our, our risk me uh, measurements and, and also follow the handling instructions. And it's also difficult to ensure that workers follow the risk management measures. So um, we need to communicate really in detail what is needed to avoid hazards uh, to environment and uh, humans. And then when it comes to compliance, yeah, there's a lot of risk because of changing legislations or new legislations. And if, uh, yeah, we need to apply this and we, ne we need to know early enough about these changes uh, to, to do a risk assessment and um, maybe to avoid risks of our products. And it's not only the financial risk because it's expensive to notify and register your substance. It's also a risk of uh, that you get fines or very bad reputation for your company. Okay, so there are two main aspects during the use of the product and uh, basically uh, being in compliance. So what kind of processes do you have in place to assess potential risks? Well, I'm sorry just going to add on that because I think another really important one is sort of the end of life kinds of risk associated with the product. So after it gets used, you know, if you, you can do a lot to sort of you know, protect your workers and the immediate consumers or, or you know, commercial users. But a lot of, you know, the biggest liabilities here, at least in the United States, have been associated with, the, you know, where it ended up, you know, at the end. So whether it's asbestos or PCBs or, or other places, uh, the, the bigger risk are really sort of these end of life risks. So, okay. After use. So basically we have three types, the use phase, the end of life phase and the being compliant yes. phase. Um, and then again, the question, what are the processes that are in place to assess those potential risks? I mean, to assess risks, it's all about data. So I would say there's data that you need to get from external uh, people. That's to have a good network, to attend conferences, to read newsletters, but also to, to have enough colleagues in the different countries who can inform you in good time about any change or any new legislation. And then on the other hand, it's all about your internal data. So you need a very good database with your product compositions and um, yeah, other information about your products and also usually a, a good uh, data source where you can um, yeah, compare your product compositions uh, to, to what's going on um, in terms of, of legislation changes and so on. And then if you have all this data together, you can start your risk assessment. Okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and, uh, I think the, the other, it, it, to go with the data though, you also need to have sort of, um, sort of a comprehensive sort of risk scenario, looking at all of the, the ways it could be released in the environment, the way people could be exposed, transformation products. We need to think through, again, sort of the whole life cycle um, to identify where you may want to you know, gather data for. Okay, and once you have made that assessment, then the next step is, of course, risk mitigation. How do you do that? Well, a variety of ways, right? If if it um, if you know if the risk is with workers, then you may you know prescribe uh, PPE. You may uh, you know um, you know communicate that through SDS or otherwise about you know, engineering controls. You may restrict the markets that you sell to because it may be safe for this kind of a use, but really inappropriate. It can't be managed safely by a customer for for another kind of use. So I, I think it's sort of the combination of, of um, you know both sort of the markets that you choose and then I think the sort of the, the guidance that you provide for your, for your customers. So basically you need to understand your complete value chain from start till finish and even the end of uh, life stage. Um, in that value chain, would it be sometimes useful to make random tests to assess the quality and risk of a product? 
I think that's very difficult to, to make random tests. I mean, what do you want to test? You can test the specification of the, of the raw materials you get. Then you might get an idea if you have any restricted substances or, or in, in, the, in the product what you are buying. But in the end, if you find something that would uh, immediately disqualify your raw material, your, your raw material supplier, and also on the other side when you know something uh, about your customer, and um, which would disqualify your customer and, and you selling the material to the customer. Um, yeah, that's, that's a difficult question and also it's very time consuming and resource intensive to, to do yeah, yeah. tests. Yeah. But that's maybe also a little bit because uh, you're in the, the specialty chemicals, eh? so you, yes. you're talking about the raw materials. James, I'm sure you can come up with an example where one of your clients has a product and they want to know if there's, for instance, PFAS inside. Right. How I, do I test this? I was going to say, it was right. It may be very different when you're sort of the producer as opposed to like a formula or someone else who's actually producing an end product. And, and there, we, we had the uh, experience here uh, recently of people uh, unexpectedly discovering benzene impurities in a bunch of consumer products who weren't aware that the process by which another product, you know, a component was made at least presented a risk of producing benzene, and that was a, 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 certainly a, a problem. So, right, so it, it, you know, you'd have to know, I, I think you make an excellent point, I mean, you need to know what you're looking for, but if you, if you, you know, um, had a process where you thought there may be um, uh, you know, the, uh, a risk that some important impurity might be present, whether it's benzene or, or uh, asbestos and talc powder, uh, that you may have a very sophisticated program to you know, make sure those things are out. But I'm afraid you, in some cases you may not know that you need to do that test until you've had um, you know, some kind of unfortunate incident. Yeah, so it's basically then you need to know that you need to find the needle in the haystack. Uh, in the Stone Age time, by the way, they burned the a haystick to yeah. find the needle, but that's another thing. Well, and, and you raised the point about sort of the regulatory risk also, you know, as chemicals have become, uh, you know, many more sort of subject to restriction, um, you know, particularly if you're further down the supply chain, it's kind of hard to know what sort of small quantities of things may be there. So in the United States, you know, testing for like PIP 3 to 1, which has been recently banned in most all uses, you know, is going to maybe um, be important or other kinds of things that have you know, experience bans just to make sure, particularly you don't have good insight to your full supply chain, to make sure those things aren't present. Okay, hey, and how important will management of change process become in a product life cycle given the ever expanding regulations? It is important and even becomes more important all the time. Um, so, I mean, wh when, I, when I come with an EU reach perspective, then um, it becomes very difficult because when you apply what you know about your substance identity from EU reach, for example, then, then you would end up having substances not, no longer listed on, on global inventories any longer. And then yeah, you somehow need, need a good way through this uh, without interrupting your business all the time, and, uh, yeah, but still fulfilling the regulatory requirements um, in the different countries. And also, I think when it comes to, to hazard assessments and, and uh, w when you know about hazards of your product, you have to communicate that uh, yeah, very quickly and, and also apply the risk uh, assessment, what you have worldwide. So uh, that's very important. Yeah. Now, I was gonna, in, uh, here we're going to mention PIP 3 to 1. There's a very important incident here where you know, that, that product had been banned and many sort of article importers and sort of end users didn't understand that it was actually a component of a lot of their parts. And there was sort of an existential crisis because it was banned, they were, you know, and all the massive inventories. People didn't know whether their inventories were compliant or not, but there's reason to believe they might not have been. It took a sort of a special act of EPA, a sort of act of sort of, of uh, forgiveness to allow people to have time to figure out whether their products are banned or not or substitute. But in any of it, if, if companies, I think, had appreciated that uh, PIP was, a, was going to be banned, that they would give, they had enough time to go and look and see, you know, was, you know anticipating this change to see whether it was a, an issue for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how can companies balance the need for innovation, which there is, of course, uh, with the need to minimize product risks? <laughs> it's so difficult to innovate <laughs> now, I would say, <laughs> because if you start innovating, then you spend a lot of money on research and development and maybe building new plants, scaling up, whatever changing existing processes and once you are there you add hundreds or millions of dollars uh, doing tests for for compliance and in the worst case you end up with some classification and nobody wants to buy your product in the end um, so 
I think the best way forward is to, to start in steps, start with small volumes, use uh, the possibilities of do small volume exemptions, polymer exemptions in different countries that you can uh, learn step by step about the hazards of the product and um, yeah, only scale up when, when, when the market allows it and when, when you have sales in, in higher volumes. Because in the end, if you do the full reach analysis, you would always find all the hazards and risks your product has right. usually. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and, and then the cost of doing all that work when you don't have a market yet, yeah. would, it would sort of kill the product before it got, ever got off the ground. So I agree with you completely yeah. that, that I think you need to sort of match your sort of investment in yeah. research looking at safety uh, with sort of the scale of development, and certainly you can l limit, um, you know, practical environmental and you know human health risk if you're just dealing with small quantities as opposed to, yeah. to large ones. So. Okay. Yeah, and and even in the in the lower tonnage bands, the tests you have, that you get a very good indication of the the hazards the product has, and then you might want to stop uh, <laughs> and not do like the OECD 443 and end end with a reprotox classification, and then. You Which don't have you're any stuck markets. with for the rest yes. <laughs> of the lifetime. Yeah. Hey, can you share some intriguing examples of risk assessment that should have been implemented or executed more thoroughly? Yes. So first of all, when I come back to this reach EU reach topic, where you have your your substance identities, we had several examples where the different teams in the in the world handled this issue differently so that led to to a lot of discussions with customers on the one hand and also with the authorities in the different countries and in the end we had to notify the substances in the different countries as new chemicals uh, with all the testing so that should have been done earlier mm. and another example is also to related to restricted substances where we just got the information about changing regulation too late and then with in a very short notice all raw materials were not uh, available um, as they were before and uh, yeah that was a nice <laughs> challenge <Yeah. laughs> but I, I, what i was thinking of was uh, mtbe in the 1980s this was uh, epa was encouraging companies to oxygenate gas to make it less polluting and so mtbe was was uh, added to gas and the, the, it wasn't that the hazards of this gasoline additive will make any more hazardous. It's going in gasoline. We always think that that's hazardous. But it turns out that it's very mobile. And it would, um, as it got into the environment, it would move a great deal. And when it got into water supplies, it's not so much that it was toxic so much as it made the water undrinkable because of taste and odor. Mm -hmm. But so the, 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 the piece in the risk assessment, I think, that uh, you know, may have been missed was the idea that it could, once it got into the environment, it could really uh, impact um, you know, aquifers. It could, could spread a great deal. It presented a different kind of risk than just uh, toxicity. Okay, thank you. And, and maybe also from a completely different point of view when it comes to study generation. So you need to, if, especially for animal testing, you need to do this very carefully because in the end, if, if um, you don't include the tox, ecotox experts and, and then you end up with results due to wrong study design, then you really have a problem yeah. um, which could have been avoided uh, when... Uh, yeah, assessed a bit earlier, yeah. Okay, hey, uh, that, that's the risk assessment phase. Uh, you already started with uh, uh, the use phase is important. Um, how can companies effectively communicate product risk to their consumers or other stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, there are the documents you have to provide like safety data sheets or labels. And uh, then additionally, you could, could have further documents like yeah, some companies call it regulatory data sheet or mm -hmm. some different names where you provide further information about um, restricted or banned chemicals or whatever. But I think in the end, if you provide too many documents uh, that nobody would read it and it's very difficult to, to see what is important and what's not so important um, with respect to, to this information. So you also has to have to establish a very good communication to, to your customers and to your suppliers also yeah. through the business, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very hard because we have, you know, so many um, lists now, you know, yeah. sin lists of different things, where the chemicals, you know, have got sort of a, a, a character. It doesn't mean that in a particular product that they represent any kind of particular risk, but just being sort of on the list and being you know, sort of being disclosed and being identified that it's on the list sort of suggests what might be kind of a misleading communication about risk. So the challenge of trying to provide context around, uh, you know, sort of significance of, of those things is, 
is difficult. Um, and and obviously, you know, often uh, communications from industry <laughs> don't get the same weight um, as, as uh, communications right from an NGO or others. Or, Okay, and do you think that the various right-to-know regulations and extended producer responsibility programs make this task easier and more effective? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so I, I would say that uh, sort of the, the extended producer responsibility is more about sort of managing the waste. So less about there's a risk associated with those things, just making sure that um, something that becomes sort of a, a societal burden is flowing back to those producers. Um, our, our, um, our right to know laws, um, I think, have been very effective in uh, sort of a shaming way. This is like our toxics release inventory about you know how much waste companies were generating. So it's been very uh, effective with companies in sort of changing the way that they do business. I don't know that it does much to communicate risk. Um, same thing with our Prop 65. You know, in California here, we've got all the disclosures. They're everywhere, and I, I haven't seen a study that, that looked at this, but I think. The conventional wisdom is that there are so many of these messages that they really don't carry um, you know, a, a helpful sort of risk message to, to, to consumers. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's totally misleading. Like in California, everything is reprotoxic or carcinogenic. So, and, and in the end, I think so. every chemical can be hazardous if not handled correctly. But on the other hand, most of the products can be handled safely if uh, we have the correct risk management measures. Okay, interesting. Um, could there be a potential conflict between risk communication and keeping certain information business confidential? Sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> everywhere where you, you need to communicate compositions or risks or whatever, um, yeah, you cannot. Um, yeah, the, the information don't remain confidential and also you have um, different uh, CBI protection ways in, in different countries. So it makes no sense to, to keep something confidential in one country while you have to disclose yeah. it in the other country, so yeah. then there's no... Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I would, what I was going to say was that, that there is a difference between, that I think there's certainly a tension between disclosure of ingredients and things um, and then disclosure of risk, so that your SDS on the one hand can you know, be very effective in talking about sort of the risks of the product and how to handle it safely without identifying each of those ingredients that are in it, you know, if, if they're sort of proprietary in some way. So, um, I think that there is some, some inherent tension there, but uh, it's mostly about, I think more about disclosure than the risk. Okay. James, based on your experiences, how can companies determine the potential liabilities associated with their products? Yeah. So, um, I, I, I think that the, the starting place is, you know, again, it's sort of the life cycle assessment, figure out, you know, where you know, as you, as you sort of foresee the market, as you foresee the uses for the chemical, um, where it's going to go, who it's going to be exposed given the way it's used. Um, it may be very different if what you make is a chemical intermediate that's going to go to one factory and be consumed. You've got a sort of limited uh, set of risks associated with that as, as opposed to something else that may end up in a consumer product, um, you know, really at an, in a, with really wide use with exposure to its consumers. So um, I think you know, really looking at the product and understanding where it's going to be, um, you know, under sort of what conditions, at least to the extent you can forecast those things, and then and then try to do the work to figure out where the the hazards might be um, associated. Or I say risk, I say the, you know, risk associated with with it in those those uses. But you really need to think about again sort of the the whole life cycle and, and understand uh, you know where these exposures and releases may be. Okay. Any experience that you want to share here? I think what is difficult with this is to know everything in the whole supply chain and until the end of the product life cycle. So you have to gather all this information and very often customers or suppliers don't understand exactly what you need and what you are asking for. And then to evaluate the risks based on this information you have, it's difficult, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, it's like with, with new chemicals, we often, you know, usually it's sort of a specific use for that. You know, there, it's being developed because there's some particular kind of need. So there is sort of an anticipated market. It may be easier there than it is with the other things that have sort of wide, wide range of uses. Okay. Hey, James, what are some of the most common legal challenges that companies face in relation to product liability? Uh, I, Why I do they call you? 
<laughs> <laughs> well, I, don't know, I was going to say sort of in, in the sort of the realm of kind of um, uh, you know product liability, you know like litigation and, and, and claims. It's they're around the science. The sort of uh, the difficulties sort of you know at dealing with the uncertainty that you have around what sort of hazards are. Um, and in sort of in relation to uh, you know, standards of government determination. So I think about like glyphosate, where here we've got you know, uh, the IARC is like the only agency in the world, I think the only agency in the world that thinks it might be a carcinogen. Everyone else who's weighed in on this, United States and Europe, sort of agree that it's not a carcinogen. Yet uh, the producers there are facing you know, billions of dollars in liability over, over cases. It, you know, it, it turns a lot on sort of whether or not this is hazardous or not. So it is um, uh, dealing with the science, um, I think being able to sort of communicate, requiring I think others who, who sort of you know, evaluate things to communicate the uncertainty around their judgments. You know, we often get numbers, this is a safe number, <laughs> um, without communicating, but you know, the, actually the real range, but it might be you know, that you know, 10 times or 1,000 times that might also be safe. We just don't have the information to draw that line any better. Um, so I think issues of, of sort of reconciling the science, um, I think, are, are really difficult. Okay. Marianne, if a company uh, identified a risk in one region, eh, for instance, a substance is tested carcinogenic, uh, let's say in Europe, should they act globally then? Uh, sure, but because it, it's, you know, it's our responsibility. I mean, we shouldn't do only the bare minimum. We should always think globally and align the risk assess assessment globally. It makes no sense that the product is carcinogenic in one reason, uh, region and then in another region it is not. James, you just came up with the example where only in a certain area it was a carcinogenic. Um, and then, should they implement it globally still based on one source? All right, and, and I think it sort of depends on the, on the, the circumstances. Certainly, you've got a government determination that it's a carcinogen. You've got to take that seriously. Um, and, and I think under our, like our uh, occupational safety rules, where there's an IARC determination, for example, you're, you're obligated to put that in your, in your communications. Um, you know, the, the, the response you know, to that information and other regions where it's not sort of regulatory, doesn't have a regulatory effect, um, I, I think you may be a little more nuanced. I mean, you may want to, um, you know, I think while, while bearing in mind that there is at least this, this one determination, um, you know, see whether there are other views or, you know, how much uncertainty is associated with that determination uh, you know, before you act, you know, to, like, to do like a ban or something like that. So, seriously, definitely got to take it seriously. Uh, you may not need to take all the same actions as you do, um, you know, in the, in the original jurisdiction. Okay. A final question. What are some emerging trends and best practices in uh, product risk assessment and liability management? I think the best, best practice would be to share more information also in, in, um, yeah, within the companies, so not only internally. So I would always be interested to, to share some lessons learned with, with other companies because everyone is like they wouldn't disclose what's, what's going on and don't talk about their problems, but in the end it helps everybody to, <laughs> to, to learn from, from others. And uh, yeah, let's say, not say from the mistakes, but from the problems or the issues others have. And then I think for the future, since there is so much um, going on regarding data, I think there must be better IT solutions to, to help um, assessing the risks and, and getting all this data together. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was going to say that um, in terms of, sort of managing um, you know, liability risks and um, uh, I think companies are doing all, and, and regulatory risks, but I think companies are learning a lot more about what you know the nature of their supply chain, what really is in all the products, so they're in a better position to respond to identify hazards, respond to regulatory kinds of concerns, and then uh, I'm not sure that uh, product safety has been the, uh, the the driver for this, but certainly the drive for circular economy and sustainability has I think changed the emphasis of a lot of product chemistries and development initiatives. Where we, um, that I think have incidental benefits. I think they tend to produce uh, safer products as a result. Marianne, thank you very much for your important insights in risk assessment. Uh, I hope it will prevent others from reinventing the wheel. And James, as an American lawyer, I'm sure that we can agree that liability is another great invention. Mm -hmm.